It gives me great pleasure to introduce Carla today. Um, she's got very wide-ranging interests, um, but in particular looking at really extreme conditions, and those extreme conditions on matter, looking at very, very high intensities, up to 10 to the power of 13 watts per centimetre squared or higher, and at very, very, very short time scales on the order of attoseconds. Um, Carla earned her PhD in 1999 at the Max Born Institute um, in Berlin. And after that, she did um, further stints in Dresden and uh, the MBI Berlin and the Technical University of Vienna and the University of Hanover. And in 2005, she saw the light and moved over to the UK as a university research fellow, um, I think in the mathematics department, is that right? Yes. City University, yeah. Um, however, she uh, became a lecturer in 2006 and she joined UCL in 2007. Um, on, an, I think it was an EPSRT Advanced Research Fellowship to start with. Yes. Yeah. Um, where she's been looking at a whole range of different things, but mainly around um, condensed matter physics and looking at condensed matter physics under very sort of extreme conditions. Um, she was born in Brazil. Um, I doesn't say the date here, but I'm not going to ask, so I won't say that. Um, and she earned her PhD in 1999. Um, she has over 80 publications, uh, numerous numbers of awards, and also over 50 invited talks. So she a, does a number of uh, journal reviews as well. And she supervised over seven PhD students and 13 master's students. And I think there's quite a few of them here today. Um, and I think they, the students in total have won over 15 different prizes at different uh, events, national and international, which is absolutely, truly astounding. Um, She's married and the proud owner of two beautiful cats, and also a mezzo soprano, I'm told, which you should be able to hear from her voice. So I'll hand over to Carla for her lecture. <laughs> so, so uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for being here, and welcome to my inaugural lecture. I'll talk about matter in very, 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 very extreme conditions. And specifically, uh, I'll look at what happens if you're dealing with very intense laser fields and ultra short time scales. What do I call intense and what do I call extreme? If you look, you see that uh, over the years, lasers have become more and more intense. And uh, if you wonder, where you should stop putting your hand, I would say, uh, here already. Um, and nowadays, you can actually achieve intensities of 10 to the uh, 20 per centimeter square or higher. So this is really, really, really intense. And maybe in the future, we can even do with lasers what used to be done with uh, accelerators, particle accelerators. Now, when I talk about ultra-fast and ultra-short, what do I mean by ultra-short? Well, attoseconds or hundreds of attoseconds, they are some of the shortest time scales that you can have in nature. And because of that, uh, they are very powerful tools for measuring and controlling electrodynamics in real time. In fact, if you look at the table behind me, you see that everything, almost everything, you can think about is above attoseconds, all, all the phenomena that you have. Attoseconds are here, then you just have nuclear structure and dynamics, and all the rest is, is high, high, high above. So this is nice, because if we can do this, uh, we can do it in several ways. For instance, you can ask yourself why. Why is this the case? Because what is happening is, many of these phenomena that take place in this regime, they happen within a fraction of the field cycle, which means that um, if you have a field cycle which is typically of 2.6 femtosecond, uh, this implies that you're going to have in a fraction hundreds of other seconds. And this is roughly the time it takes for uh, an electronic wave packet to travel through atomic distances. So you can have, for instance, a second processes. You shine this intense light, which is typically infrared uh, or low frequency, and you can get very, very high harmonics. 
or you can get high energy photoelectrons, or you can even combine high harmonics, and by doing that, you can generate other second pulses. Now, this is possible because this is a phenomena, they owe their existence to uh, laser induced recognition recombination, which means that uh, you have initially one electron, which is released uh, by tunneling your multiphotonization. This electron is accelerated by the field, is driven back to the core, and depending on the interactions, certain things will happen. For instance, you may recombine, and then you have high harmonics, or you may rescatter so that you are going to have high energy photoelectrons, for instance, high energy above threshold ionization, or you can also have uh, an inelastic collision and rip off other electrons. So you're going to have non sequential uh, multiple ionization, non sequential double ionization. So all these things, they happen and uh, they have uh, to occur at very specific times because um, the field is dictating the pace uh, of the whole phenomenon, namely when it is being ripped off, when it is being driven back, etc., etc. So the field acts, if you wish, loosely speaking, as a clock. So it dictates also phases and the whole dynamics. And if you look at a big, big, big application in the past decade, uh, a good example is imaging. Imaging of matter, because you can control uh, matter and you can image matter. And uh, here you have a timeline. First, uh, people started to look at structural minima uh, and very simple things that are static. Then there was a reconstruction of an atomic orbital, molecular orbitals, etc. This, this paper, in fact, is a milestone by Itatani et al. And then uh, in, since 2009, core dynamics have become important. So you're looking more and more and more at complex targets, uh, at uh, organic molecules, at what is happening, excitation, relaxation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now the direction is towards solids. So now uh, the systems are becoming more and more and more complex. So. Uh, Within this work, let me start very, uh, with a very simple picture. So let's look at time dependent Schrodinger equation, one electron. This is already uh, an issue if you want to solve this analytically. And a lot of things are going to change because we have typically the atomic Hamiltonian and we have the coupling with the field. Now, if you look at weak fields, what do you do? You use perturbation theory. Why do you use perturbation theory? because normally um, these fields are much weaker than the atomic binding forces, which means that they're not going to change the structure a lot. But what started to happen in the 80s and 90s is that when you start to increase the intensities, you are going to have that this field is going to distort uh, a lot uh, the bound state. So you're going to have huge stark shifts and they're going to be comparable to the photon energies. So that's when people found the first discrepancies from perturbation theory. Subsequently, uh, you are going to have a situation in which the laser fields are uh, very close to the atomic binding force. So it's going to break it down. And because it breaks down, people have looked at several, several other approaches. And one of them, which is now an old theory, is the strong field approximation. Uh, this is uh, the cornerstone of my field, has been used since the 90s to deal with the problem. And if we look at a very simple uh, model, one electron time dependent Schrodinger equation, which you cannot solve analytically for a strong field, what you do is you first neglect uh, the uh, field when the electron is bound, so you have field free bound states, or you can neglect the binding potential when the electron is in the continuum. So we're going to have field dress plane waves, which we call Volkov states. And we're going to neglect the internal structure as well. Now we have pros and cons. Uh, this is really, 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 really an important approach because with this approach, what happens is that you can describe all these processes I was talking about of laser-induced recollision, laser-induced recombination, etc., 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 as uh, integrals. 
So you are going to have several paths which are going to interfere and you have a quantum mechanical description. Now, uh, this is an advantage because you cannot solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation analytically, but you can solve the Volkov solution analytically or in some cases the field free Hamiltonian ham analytically. So this makes your life much, 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 much easier. And uh, you have the enlarged systems and multi electrodynamics, which you would like to look at. And it also gives you an intuitive orbit based interpretation. You can really assess quantum interference internally. Uh, and this is an advantage if you want to know uh, what is going on. Now, there are also quite a few drawbacks, and they have become apparent since the past decade. One of them is because you assume uh, that uh, your continuum is uh, represented by Volkov waves, you have uh, no residual binding potentials. You also cannot take into account core dynamics. I mean, if you modify it, you can. We're going to see that. You break the gauge invariance and you break translation invariance as well. These are more technical issues I'm not going to talk about. But uh, these are big issues and uh, quantum interference here is very important. So we want to find something that can overcome these problems and that also allows me to describe a system going from A to B. If it's going from A to B, quantum mechanically in several possible ways, all these amplitudes are going to interfere. And I would like to have some information about that. These pictures, for instance, are examples of quantum interference uh, effects, which occur here in photoelectron spectra and high harmonics. We're going to talk about them. And nowadays, it, this was already important 10 years ago. Nowadays, this is really, really, really paramount because what is happening is there are many directions in which the field is evolving and uh, there is a lot of activity looking at correlated multi-electron dynamics, larger systems, light-induced uh, resonances, etc., etc. So we are moving from an unstructured continuum to a structured continuum, which means that it does need to be replaced. SFA is the cornerstone uh, if you're trying to do something more mathematical, something more analytical, but it does need replacement. Okay, so let's pick up the 10 year challenge. This is more or less when I arrived at UCL or arrived in London as you wish. Uh, you could see that um, I was already thinking about it. And um, my goal with my advanced fellowship was to um, develop a novel semi-analytic approach which replaced the SFA. And we would like to apply this to molecules and to attosecond image of matter. Now, we didn't have a lot of idea about that. And uh, in this project, I have partners from mathematical physics and from optical physics. And I was actually very optimistic because I had worked with people who actually helped develop the SFA, namely uh, Maciek Levenstein and Wilhelm Becker. So uh, we decided uh, to have a look and see what we could learn. And these, uh, within many years, have helped establish a lot of research lines. Uh, this is a very simplified uh, diagram to tell you what we have been doing. But we have modeled a lot of phenomena, high harmonic generation, above threshold ionization, uh, non-sequential double ionization. We have been trying novel approaches, testing them using this phenomena, then looking at imaging and control, and all these things are very much inter intertwined. So uh, basically, uh, now talking business, what I will do is I will provide you with uh, a selected uh, lecture on several topics. And I will start to talk about uh, high order harmonic generations in molecules, which is something we had to do because we wanted to understand the old theory, and we wanted to understand ultra-fast imaging better. And also, we would like to control the electron dynamics. Also, I'll talk about below threshold non-sequential ionization. I had already worked on above uh, the threshold, which is electron impact uh, types of non-sequential ionization, but we would like really to learn how to incorporate the internal structure of the system using some kind of semi-analytic setting. 
So it was about testing image impossibilities, testing control, testing quantum effects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, also, um, I will talk about something we have succeeded at, and this took really a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of time, which is to develop and to test a new theory uh, using all this previous information that we obtained in these two items, in these two items, and then. Uh, because it's always good to look around and test new things, uh, we also uh, we hear about alternative approaches to uh, strong field phenomena. So let's continue. Talking about high harmonic generation, what we wanted to do, just to recap, was to improve the old theory, modify the old theory, understand what imaging was about, and also playing around with the target and with the field. Okay, so for the uninitiated, if you're talking about high harmonics uh, in this intensity regime, what you look at is you're going to have a typical spectrum which has a plateau, meaning a region with harmonics of roughly the same intensities followed by a sharp cutoff. And because you have this light induced uh, recombination, the cutoff is going to be related to the highest kinetic energy with which the electron can return. So, uh, for monochromatic field specifically, which you can assume if the, if the pulse is long enough, you consider uh, this law, and this law has been tested and it has been found out to be true, it's uh, really uh, universal. Uh, this maximum energy depends on the ionization potential and on the ponderal motive energy, which is the electron is coming back, it's going to recombine, and is going to release all that energy that it gained from the field, um, in form of uh, hard ultraviolet radiation. So, um, if you look at the plateau, what you have, in fact, this is a seminal paper here uh, on the right. If you look at the plateau, you're going to have uh, harmonics uh, that are related to two interfering main orbits, which are known as the shortest, the short orbit and the long orbit. These are the two main orbits that interfere and they coalesce at the cutoff. So if you look at time profile of high harmonic generation, you see that you're going to have arch-like structures coming back to that. So, okay, we have a look then, start from the beginning like everybody else, look at structural static information. So how can we obtain this information? Well, we are going to have rescattering, you're going to have uh, recombination, etc., at different centers. So you have spatial, uh, spatially separated uh, centers in a molecule, so we are going to have a double slit type of interference, and you are going to have a certain shape for uh, the molecular orbitals. So uh, this is also going to influence how your harmonic uh, spectrum is going to look. So you can alter this information by uh, considering the core dynamics, uh, multiple uh, orbital contributions, distortions in the orbitals, and the laser field. Uh, and we're going to look at some of them, which uh, we tried as much as possible to assess using analytical methods. So we had a look, and this is the old theory. Just to give you an idea, what is really important here is you're going to have a multiple integral which contains all the specs I'm talking about, and you have this DZP, which is a dipole matrix element um, associated uh, with this recombination and with this ionization, and uh, this reproduces all these structures, and you have some kind of semi-classical action as well. So, the standard formulation for molecules, you have steepest descent method, which you can associate with orbits, you have single active electron, single active orbital, and you freeze all the molecule, and you just allow the highest occupied uh, atomic orbital to evolve. And we were not happy with that. This was an assumption that everybody was using at the time. So we decided to go beyond. So we considered then that we would unfreeze two orbitals. So just to give you an idea, we took then as, a, as an example uh, N2. So you had HOMO, which is the highest occupied molecular orbital. You had HOMO minus one, which is second highest uh, molecular orbital. And we decided to have a look. And we modified the SFA 
so that we would move from one electron wave function to a two electron wave function which was unsymmetrized according to what we wanted to do. And this gave us a multi-channel uh, result. So we have several transition amplitudes also accounting for these multiple channels. So what we found was the following, that basically the other channels, homo minus one, etc., because the geometry was very different, they were uh, actually playing a role in blurring this structural minimum. And uh, we also decided then to look at coherent superpositions because in principle you can prepare uh, your molecule in a coherent superposition, for instance, of the homo and the lumo. And what was very interesting is that we found that you would have recombination uh, and ionization from several uh, orbitals and these would be mapped in the spectrum. For instance, there you can see that you have a uh, two center minimum uh, and you have cutoff related with uh, the homo and a cutoff related with the lumo. So this was very nice and good, but and we decided also to look at uh, homonuclear heteronuclear pairs because we wanted to see what kind of distortion was being caused by the asymmetry. So where you had a nodal plane, you would suddenly have a um, nodal surface. Yes, we had a lot of distortion. We also looked then moving from the target to the field at the field. So we would use then orthogonally polarized fields to try to see what changes in this rescattering picture. And we actually could show that this electron, when it was coming back and recombining, it was coming back at an angle, and the angle was different for each possible path for which the electron was coming back. So this means that uh, if you would add everything together, these shifts that you would observe in these structural conditions, which are structural and from a very simple model, they would basically make a mess and they would blur. So we then decided to talk to Professor Marangos at Imperial. And in real life, what is happening, you don't have a single molecule. You're going to have a focus. So we wanted to see, OK, what happens if you are looking at a target, really a gaseous target within the focus? Can you control this? Can you eliminate one of the orbits which is making a mess? Because we have seen, we have many interfering orbits that are coming back at different angles. And you have all this uh, interference. So we went then for a realistic model and we could see we could do that. Because uh, what you have is you can select at a single uh, molecule response level, you can select the short trajectory and at the propagation as well. So this trajectory actually is very easy to single out because it phase matches on the axis and the other ones phase match off axis. So in fact, uh, we were happy with that and we thought, okay, now we understand, we understand a bit about imaging, we understand a bit about molecules, and now we would like to look at the core dynamics. We want to look at excitation and electron-electron correlation. So we decided then to have a look at non-sequential ionization below the threshold. And this is actually a very uh, nice work because apart from one paper that existed and wasn't even taking care of these distributions, we had to do a lot, a lot, a lot from scratch. And this is a timeline of this phenomenon. So you can see the milestones. This is the quintessential example of electron-electron correlation with strong fields, meaning that um, the effects are huge. First, they lead to orders of magnitude difference in the yield. Then uh, you are going to have non-vanishing momenta, basically. And you have all sorts of distributions that can be measured nowadays. And what we really wanted to do is we wanted to look at the mechanism below the threshold. And we had a lot of experience with the mechanism uh, over there, which is electron impact ionization. So, in the parameter range of interest, if your intensity is high enough, when the first electron comes back, it can release the second electron immediately, it can give enough energy for it to overcome the ionization potential. But 
if you are what we call below the threshold, your intensity is not enough to give uh, the kinetic energy for the electron to release a second one. So it's going to excite a second electron. And the second electron is going to hang around and then it's going to leave. So, fine. This is what we knew before. I had been working uh, on that quite a lot. And on electron impact ionization, when you have one electron comes back, rips off the second, you can do the same analytically. You can write uh, Feynman diagrams and you can compute uh, the transition amplitude and the probability as well using the SFA. We need that um, first, uh, <coughs> long-range interactions would favor an equal momentum. Second, in that momentum plane, the first and the third quadrant would be occupied. And we also knew that uh, quantum effects, they were washed out. That classical models actually work very, very, very well there. So this was actually something uh, we realized that we went through a lot of trouble to do this quantum mechanically, but classically it was working quite well. So how about this one? So this is what we learned on the way. And um, we're looking at recollision excitation with subsequent ionization, uh, which means that now you take a Feynman diagram where both electrons are initially in uh, bound states, actually in the ground states, which are assumed to be a product state. One electron leaves, goes to a Volkov state. Second electron hangs around. Then uh, first electron comes back. Uh, rescatters with the first, promotes the, first, the second electron in, uh, to an excited state, and this is going to hang around there until the field is high enough so that it can leave. And there's going to be a time delay between this, and the Feynman diagram is slightly more complicated, and also uh, this can be viewed, and actually this was a contribution by us, that it can be viewed as two time-ordered uh, ATL-like processes. <laughs> Um, which was nice because this allowed us to find momentum constraints, which means that uh, we predicted that the distributions would occupy the four quadrants in, momentum, in the momentum plane, uh, and it would look like a cross, and if you decrease the intensity, it's going to look like a ring. And these are uh, the distributions we expect if we integrate over the transverse momentum uh, components. Now, people at the time, it has changed since then, but at the time people expected anti-correlation because they thought, okay, there's going to be a time delay. So one electron is going to live with uh, positive momentum, the other is going to live with negative momentum. And you're going to occupy then the second and the fourth quadrants. But it wasn't like that, and we did some computations, and actually we have shown that this wasn't the case. It just obeyed if you don't include uh, the part which is related to the structure of your bound state. It just obeys the constraints perfectly. So now let's look at imaging. Well, you can also do imaging because the imprints of the intermediate state and of the electron electron interaction, they are in fact in this distribution. So if you look at them, you can say if the electron was excited from an S to a P state or from an S to a D state or what kind of interaction uh, was exciting the electron. And we're very happy about that because we decided then to look at control. If you have few cycle pulses, uh, what do you have to do to uh, control this and to control electron emission. You are going to have a pulse. The, uh, there's a phase difference between the pulse envelope and uh, the oscillating part of the pulse, which is ca the carrier envelope phase. And this is going to lead to some changes uh, in the distributions. And we're quite happy because we could actually reproduce um, everything people were finding in the experiments. And we could even say that this was being excited to a uh, 4S state, so from the shape of what we got. So the transition was from a 3P to a 4S state. Fine, how about quantum interference? Does quantum interference play a role? Well, um, we knew that electron impact ionization could be treated classically, but if you go 
below the threshold, what is happening? Because you're going to excite, right? The first electron comes back, excites the second electron, and you can have excitation to several states from this collision. Do you agree? So how do you know to which intermediate state the second electron was excited, right? And uh, we decided to have a look at what kind of interference we could have. And um, you could have interference between several events and you could have interference between several channels because also, don't forget, you cannot paint electron one red and electron two blue. They are indistinguishable and are going to interfere. So we found these two types of interference and it was quite fun because uh, there were publications in which they could find all these shapes but they were changing when you increase the pulse length. So it was done, this was done with few cycle pulses until we moved to many cycle pulses. And uh, basically uh, what we realized is that we had, when we were doing our calculations, a fourfold uh, uh, symmetry. And these people suggested that it could be broken by quantum interference. And the idea was very good. We may have some uh, disagreements with how they approach the problem, but we decided to have a look. And actually, we did find that interference was so robust, so robust, because what we saw when we started to do these calculations is that you could do everything. You could integrate over transverse degrees of freedom. You could include focal averaging. You could do everything to try to kill it, and yet it was there. And we think that these features that they were finding, that they are related to quantum interference. And in fact, in Wuhan and in other groups, they now are claiming that they are measuring quantum interference effects. And of course, we are looking at it. So we are very happy with that. Because this was something we didn't expect. We found many, uh, we spent many, many months thinking this was a bug because we were obsessed with this classical picture. And at the end, we even had analytic conditions showing that Isuzu was a hyperbole, etc., etc. And we derived a lot of things which actually showed that this wasn't a bug. And we came to conclude that the world was more quantum than you think. <laughs> now, here, we were really, really, really happy because we spent 10 years, or almost 10 years, trying to find an approach that is going to rep, uh, replace the strong field approximation. And we tried, I, I don't know how many things, and finally, it works. So we're also invited to the uh, after party, if you want. <laughs> so <laughs> that's when then we introduced the Coulomb quantum orbit strong field approximation, which is a semi-analytic method, is orbit-based, and it has the advantage of treating the laser field and the binding potential on equal footing, which is amazing because, I mean, uh, this is one of the key difficulties. And actually, I only know a handful of groups who can do that. And we had a look then at also another image technique that exists, which is photoelectroholography. And what is very nice about it is that you can use high energy photoelectrons and also interference patterns that come from them to retrieve structural and dynamical information. So if you see, you see, for instance, this looks like a spider. Agree? So uh, these are features that you find and uh, they have been measured and there has been some modeling, but we found that what was missing in this modeling was the Coulomb potential. It has been really uh, been modeled in a very simple way. But what you do, and the idea of using this and talking about holography is because for holography, you have phase differences. So you have uh, a probe and you have a pump, and you can use this to uh, reconstruct, in fact, uh, your target. And this is also, in our opinion, is contentious. I'm not going to discuss the issue here, but in our opinion, this is also a holographic structure which forms near threshold. And you cannot reproduce this using strong field approximation. This is the fan-shaped uh, structure, 
which if you see is uh, this structure over here that looks like a fan. And this really requires the interplay of the Coulomb potential and of the field. And this uh, fan is an interference feature. It is quantum interference. So we need something quantum. We need the Coulomb potential and we need the field. And uh, these ideas of photoelectron homography were around. So you have several types of uh, orbits that can interfere. But in these models here, this was quite standard and quite simplified. So we decided to have a look at uh, <coughs> beyond uh, what was done. And using our method, which is a type of path integral method developed in the complex plane for uh, strong fields, at least in the first part of the contour, you can have interference, you can have tunneling, and you can have the Coulomb potential and the laser field. So let's see. And uh, what we realized is that uh, this method was very good because a lot of people were also doing Coulomb corrective methods. And the difficulty is not to put the Coulomb potential in the orbit, the difficulty is to get the phases right. Because if you go through orbit A, from A to B along orbit A, it's going to have a different phase than if you go from uh, uh, A to B following another orbit. And these phases, they're going to lead to the patterns. And people were launching to get clear uh, interference patterns. They were launching 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 orbits, and hello, hello, we needed four. <laughs> so we were like, yay, like these cats uh, in the picture. So we need four types of orbits. The first type is the most boring one because it's going to reach the detector directly, but it is slowed down by the potential. The other types, they behave like laser-dressed hyperbole. So it's like when you launch a satellite, the potential is helping accelerate uh, this. And um, the fourth orbit goes around the core. And a lot of them, they don't have counterparts in the strong field approximation, just orbit one and this one of these hyperboles. The other ones don't. And this was actually a good result because uh, the Coulomb potential completely changed the topology. So you cannot really think okay, I have just this backscattering and I, I don't have a potential, and it is tricky. And here is a comparison we did with an ab initial solution over four cycles. We have more if you want to have a look. Uh, you can see we get the spider, we get the fan, we get everything, we get the right number of fringes. And uh, we decided to have a look because we can isolate the orbits. First thing, we looked at the contribution to the distributions from each orbit. One, two, three. And here, this prefactor is more related to the uh, geometry and to the stability of the orbit. So we decided to have a look. And what you see is in the strong field approximation, we would expect a blob for vanishing momentum because the electron would tend to leave uh, when the peak, uh, when the field is maximum, which is vanishing momentum. Now, it doesn't. You see these two blobs. And in fact, this means that when the electron is trying to leave, what is happening is the Coulomb potential is pulling it or is accelerating it. So it cannot leave with vanishing momentum. It's going to be recaptured. Now, a lot of people who were modeling the spider, they were talking about side lobes. So this means that they were looking at the structure and they were claiming this was interference. It wasn't. In fact, this is what some people call frustrated tunneling ionization. And it was showing in these distributions. So uh, for this electron to leave, it cannot leave if it has a uh, vanishing momentum. In, in none of the processes we're looking at. So OK. Now, how about the spider? Ah, we get the spider. So the spider comes from these two hyperboli that are interfering. And in fact, we went beyond everyone else because we actually showed how the spider formed. And people are saying, yeah, they come from there. And they had some argument which was hand waving, but we really showed, okay, it comes from this type of interference. Now, 
Um, how about the fan? Well, there were some discussions going on saying that the fan was a resonance with uh, some highly excited bound state or that this fan came from the hyperbole and uh, this is a really contentious issue. We just had to look and we found that what people normally call double slit, temporal double slit, uh, is distorted by the Coulomb potential and leads to this type of picture, to the fan. So actually it would establish that the fan was a holographic structure, which was uh, coming from the presence of the Coulomb potential. Now, there are many, 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 many other structures which actually have never been <coughs> identified. And actually, they are being identified, but I'm not going to talk about it right now. And one of them are, we call the spirals, because this first orbit is very difficult to resolve and is very difficult to compute. And in the limit, it tends to some kind of ray scattering that doesn't exist in the SFA, because SFA is like the born series with a field dressed uh, momentum in the continuum. So it allows for um, rescattering to occur only at one point, namely the origin. And you don't have all this flexibility that our method is giving. So here you have interference with um, structures going around the core. And you're going to see this interference. They are important close to the perpendicular momentum axis. And you get uh, these spirals. And actually, uh, they have been measured by our collaborators really recently. Uh, more details coming soon. And there are many, 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 many more overlooked patterns. So you have a uh, phase difference between start times larger than half a cycle. They give you other fans, other spirals, other spiders and you can shift it over a cycle. So the message for us was that the presence of the Coulomb potential is something that is so important and, and it's really, really, really important that uh, cannot be underestimated and overlooked. But to be able to distinguish this, you cannot uh, have millions of trajectories. You have to be able to work backwards as we were doing. Now, this is the strange part of the talk, not strange, uh, but we always like to be creative and we like to bring methods from other areas to uh, strong field uh, and other second science because it gets boring if you don't look around and uh, there is Nothing more boring than normal, according to Patty Smith. I don't know if uh, it's true or not. But one thing we decided to have a look was uh, Bohmian trajectories. So the ansatz is similar from what we have seen. You have basically an action, and you have um, a density. You insert this in the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, and you get uh, these coupled equations which are uh, giving you some kind of hydrodynamic formulation of uh, the propagation of your system. So this means that you're treating this as a quantum fluid and has a quantum potential. OK, so we decided to apply this to high harmonic generation. We did, and we got what we didn't expect. Because we, we have always this classical picture in your mind. Electron leaves, electron comes back. So we saw that the Bohmian trajectory that was actually giving you plateau and giving you cutoff was just hanging in there, in the core. But somehow, it needed the other ones so that it would get the right phase and lead to the harmonics. We looked at one which was leaving and coming back, and we just got a smooth background. It wasn't the real thing. And then what is going on? We didn't understand, but uh, this 
actually formulation of what is bound and what is continuum, sometimes if you use classical methods, it's a very, very naive formulation. So we decided to put it to a test and decided to look at the contributions of this single Bohmian trajectory which was in the middle and never left and led to these nice harmonics. And what we found when we used a Gabo transform, which is a window Fourier transform, which can allows you to extract not only uh, the frequency information, but also the time information. So we could extract when the uh, harmonics were being generated. Uh, what we found was, okay, let's try for one in the middle, one which is hanging around in the middle and then leaves, and one who always leaves. And the one in the middle gave you arch-like structures, this time frequency spectrum, which looks like what you would get if you had an ensemble of classical trajectories leaving and then coming back. So the phase of this wave function is behaving like uh, an ensemble of classical trajectories. And if you think about it, what you are doing when you're solving strong field approximation or Coulomb corrected or Coulomb quantum orbit strong field approximation is you are putting these trajectories in your action. You're putting it in your phase. So it was in front of us all the time and we didn't see that it was behaving that way. Because we were thinking classically, yeah, you're going to have something that is going to leave and is going to come back. No. All these paths that are associated with classical trajectories, you are putting in the phase. And that's what this single trajectory there is giving you. Now, you can see that if you start to move away from the core, this is going to start to degrade. So you have, <coughs> for instance, here a peripheral trajectory, which is still hangs a bit around in the core has some arch-like structures. You have this one, which doesn't have. And by the way, these points here, I don't know what is wrong with the projector today. Uh, it is a bit blurred. But um, if you look at um, these arches, these lines, they are, in fact, um, computed from an ensemble of classical trajectories returning to the core. So. This had nothing, nothing, nothing to do with classical. And uh, we decided then to look, OK, we have to go to the phase space. Because this idea, the electron leaves and is doing this and is orbiting, this is very naive. Because you can have an electron at the core, which is so fast that it is in the continuum. So, you need to go to the phase space and you need to look at uh, initial value representations. And uh, we looked then at integral differential equations. So we decided to seek methods from quantum chemistry which deal with that. And basically what you have is you have trajectory guided expansions of the time dependent Schrodinger equation. And you have swarms of Gaussians. So you have something like that. There. You, you mimic the initial wave packet by uh, an ensemble of trajectories, and each of them is being gu guided by a Gaussian. So you allow also interference, and you allow also uncertainty. Fine. So this is what we also borrowed from people from quantum optics. This is a Wigner quasi-probability distribution computed for a static field. And what you can see is that this guy here, is a separatrix, so you have a phase portrait, one d phase portrait, and we looked at strong field ionization. This saddle here is the Stark saddle. You have a center, and you can see, I mean, we checked all these trajectories that are guiding the wave function. They are never crossing any separatrix. The ones you get from coupled coherent states and Hermann-Kruck propagator, they don't cross but the wave function does. And this was actually very interesting because you can see tunneling happening and uh, you can see, for instance, you have here everything that is leaving with momenta uh, below the separatrix is, above is uh, over the barrier ionization. So it's going over the barrier because it has higher energy, has high momentum, but with time it starts to decrease and is going to cross uh, classically forbidden regions. 
And we also decided to put as a test and calculate harmonics because it's a highly coherent process. And we realized that the agreement was very, very, very good. So our conclusion is the trajectories are local, but the wave function you generate with them isn't. And this is uh, very nice to know because we decided to do something which went beyond the toy model and we computed also a photoelectron spectrum with that. Here you have an ab initio computation. Here you have one which was done with hermann Kluge propagator and you can see that the results are identical. So very nice, it's nice to try strange things. And the last strange thing we tried was uh, to look at Matthew's equation. This was uh, related to plasmonics and the downward approximation which we borrowed from cold gases. And uh, we were looking at high harmonic generation in homogeneous fields. And in homogeneous fields, they are important uh, because possibly if you have confinement, for instance, in nanostructures, in, in condensed matter, you can enhance the uh, harmonic spectra to orders of magnitude. So uh, we borrow this formalism and we decide then to look at what happened and analyze this in phase space and analyze uh, by making an analogy with particles in an ion trap. And we found that we had multiple time scales, which actually were related to the material equation. We could predict regimes for which you would get stable harmonic spectra. You could also uh, find several phase space configurations which would explain everything people were obtaining and they were just describing and we were explaining. So we were actually very happy with that. And just to close, I don't know uh, what life is going to bring. And um, I know that this is not the end of the story. I expect certain things to become easier, certain things to become more difficult. Uh, we have been discussing with a lot of people, so we are intending to move, uh, to continue working on tailored fields, to look at more and more quantum aspects because we have realized that the quantum optics people know much, much, much more than we do. We are still interested in strange things and novel methods, always. And finally, I would like to thank a lot of people which are not all included that there, but thank you all uh, and many, 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 many more. Uh, for all your help and all your collaboration in all these years. And we have here people from uh, strong field and auto science, from quantum chemistry, from mathematical physics, from uh, also everywhere in the world. And if I talk about being thankful, I think an important point to make is I was a bit reluctant when uh, Leah Yi and my student Abby said, do you want to advertise this? Because this is a heavy burden and it's actually very sad if you think about it that in the whole of the UK you have 25, maybe now with me, 26 professors who come from a minority background actually and, and who descend uh, from an African back background. So uh, I said, okay, uh, shall I take this burden up on me? Shall I not? And then I realized that I'm not only thankful to all these people who were in this list. No, I'm thankful also because I had a lot of conditions, even though uh, times have often been turbulent and I have really uh, sometimes struggled. Uh, I had a lot of uh, pain and I had to persist and there was a lot of effort. I have to say that I was lucky to be born in a family that was wealthy and they were supportive, even though I am a bit of the red sheep because they are all a bit to the right and I'm to the left. <laughs> but <laughs> they are very supportive. They supported me all along the way. I had access. They had also money and they invested in me. I had also access 
to the best education you can get in South America because, okay, some Colombians may disagree, but this is one of the best uh, universities in, in South America, is in Sao Paulo. And that I went to do my PhD in Berlin, uh, which is an amazing city. Uh, it was just being rebuilt in the 90s, so it was an amazing experience to be there. Uh, then I came to the UK. Before Brexit, I would agree with you. After Brexit, I don't know. <laughs> we have to wait and see that this was, okay, I saw the light. Uh, I, I actually uh, like many places. But if you think about it, okay, there has been persistence, there has been a lot of uh, fighting, but this also means that I met in my life favorable causes and conditions to be able to achieve that. Because we can have a look at a much older map. Okay, and this is my DNA map. Sorry, I didn't expect this projector to be. I tested that on here it looks well, but this looks like me without glasses. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a bit bad today. Uh, which actually shows that I am indigenous, Nigerian, Middle Eastern, European, a lot of things together, even Eskimo, if I believe that, but I think there's a fluctuation. <laughs> and uh, what you have to think about is that there has been a lot of stuff going on. Say, if I were, if I were an indigenous person living in the Americas in the 15,000s, I could have died because when the Europeans came, 90% uh, of the people died that were living there. These were highly advanced civilizations, but they didn't have resistance to the European viruses. So people don't talk about, no, they were not discovered, they were invaded, okay? Uh, on top of that, if you look at my European ancestors, uh, at least two strains from what I know, they belong to the second wave of immigration from the Iberian Peninsula, and you know what these people were? they were what you call new Christians, which means that uh, they were forced to convert to Christianity because they were Jewish. If they didn't, they would be burned. But then uh, the Iberian Peninsula was unified, so they had to flee to Brazil because they would be burned anyway. I don't know if specifically any um, of my white ancestors was branded a witch, I don't know, but I know that uh, they immigrated to Brazil more or less at the time when this was happening. So it could be that I am the great grand grand granddaughter of the witches. Uh, <laughs> the Spanish Inquisition didn't manage to burn. On top of that, uh, Brazil was the last Western nation to uh, abolished slavery, 1888. This is really not so long ago. And over four million people, they were taken from West Africa, mainly Nigeria, and they were taken to Brazil. They were not slaves, they were enslaved. And it's not like, ah, you have a, a boat and then you put everybody from Nigeria there. No, it was horrible. And if I had been, I mean, I could have, you know, I could have died of disease, I could have been burned, and I could have been enslaved. So actually, this is a heavy burden to go and talk about these things now after the end of my lecture, but you have to create causes and conditions for the people who are coming after you, because if this didn't happen to me, it's because uh, there have been abolitionists, there have been fighting for human rights, there have been all these things going on. So you are a cause. You are a product of something that happened before, but you are a cause. And because you could see that my opera gear is a bit gothic, I'm going to close with that. <laughs> and thank you very much for your attention.
presentation. Um, as a chemist, I absolutely love seeing the pictures that you have of orbitals because I teach how, how you bond nitrogen atoms together and to actually see those pictures are absolutely stunning. So we need to steal some of those. Um, you've had an absolutely fantastic career over a, a wide range of different things. And I think you basically show the enthusiasm and passion that you have for the science was really well demonstrated this afternoon over a number of different areas. And, and we're really proud that you're here at UCL and also that you went through your heritage with us as well because we're also proud that you're acting as a kind of standard bearer for that and really standing up for some of these, um, some of these causes. Um, but the science absolutely stunning. There's a number of people in the audience that will have worked with you over the years. Um, and, you know, really great lecture. So all I can say is we're going to go now to, I think, uh, E3, E7 for a drink uh, and to recover a little bit because we're a bit of a tour de force with some, some of these things. Um, the quantum mechanics in particular kind of went past me, but I'm sure there'll be people that understand that. So if you join with me in thanking Carla for an absolutely fantastic lecture.